Creative mind, designer, an amazing musician who is living life on her own terms and her own way, the amazing Celtic musician Ella Harp joins me today in this episode of the Mind, Body and Soul podcast as we talk all about her struggles and journey through her time in Scotland. We talk about her music and the inspirations behind why the harp was her instrument of choice and also about the spirit and passion that drives her work. That and so much more on today's episode of the Mind, Body and Soul podcast with John Morris. Welcome to the Mind, Body and Soul podcast with John Morris. Inspiring, motivating and educating you in finding balance in the craziness of day-to-day life. Learn from and listen to a man who has a wealth of life experience, from business to bodybuilding, artist to author, and has learned to deal with his own physical and mental wellness. But that's not all. Each week, John interviews and picks the minds of special guests from all around the world and from all walks of life, from actors to authors, wrestlers to warriors, business owners to life coaches, and so much more. Welcome to today's episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Okay, folks. Well, welcome to another exciting episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast, where we inspire you, motivate you, and educate you on your journey in finding balance in the craziness of day-to-day life. I am your host, as always, John Morris, and today I am delighted not only to be with you guys, but to to to, to be with a guest that today we're literally going to examine the mind, the heart, and the soul of an amazing lady. My guest today is an upcoming and very, very unique musician. She's got a unique brand of music all over the place and even on Netflix. She's had successful tours across the United States and even going all the way into Scotland as well. Her independently released debut album, Who Asked You Back, received airplay on over 85 radio stations nationally and internationally and reached number four and number two on Roots Music Reporter and the top 50 folk and top 50 contemporary folk album charts. So there's an amazing thing. Um, she's changing the way people are thinking about the harp. And I want you to welcome to the show for the first time, the wonderful, always an amazing Ella Harp. Ella, welcome to the show, my dear. How are you doing today? Thank you so much. I'm doing great. That was a <laughs> delightful introduction. The best I think I've ever walked into. So thank you. <laughs> I always we always say that when folks um, come on the show and things, my job is to get you over with the audience because in doing that, we're getting our show over as well. Of and course, it's, it's it's weird when you're looking at it after the craziness of today, and I'm thinking, okay, we're just kind of flowing with things now. But I managed to, I get get all that out without tripping over any words, so it was wonderful. How Very are you doing today? You're doing well. I'm doing well. Yes, thanks. It's a it's a nice kind of cloudy morning. We're getting some rain. I've got my tea, so I'm feeling I'm feeling all the cozy vibes, which is just the way you want to feel on a Tuesday, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. What kind of tea is it? Is it Earl Grey uh, early breakfast or? It is mint. Oh, mint tea. Good shout. Good shout. Spearmint. Spearmint. Like the spearmint. Oh yeah, definitely. Sorry, folks. We're getting kind of carried away here. Uh, we've got connections that I found with Ella all over the place, which we're going to examine obviously during this show today. Um, But before I get too far ahead of myself, Ella, for the audience that hasn't met you before, share with us a little bit about yourself and what it is that you do. For sure. Yeah, so I am a musician, I'm an artist, I'm a a designer, a seamstress, all kinds of creative outlets, but mostly music being the sort of forefront of things. And I play the harp and the banjo, I'm a singer-songwriter. And um, yeah, I've been playing since I was eight. I spent four years living in Scotland. So I'm excited for that connection. And yeah, I live in California now and I write music and put music out and try to run all the crazy aspects of doing your own business as one singular person. (laughs) Oh, yes. I completely agree with you. At the moment, as as our folks will know, um, Katie and I, Katie's my wife, but we're actually juggling two businesses right now because I'm a professional artist, you know, similar similar to what you're saying, but also I'm running uh, Mind, Body and Soul as well. And the both of them are growing really quickly at the same time. So it's a bit like, stress is just flowing through my body at the moment. Oh my gosh. Well, that's fantastic for the growth, but yes, the stress does absolutely come along with that. Oh yes. So talk to us a little bit about what early life was like for you. Mine was, was interesting. My mother was a, was a a sort of 
I suppose you could call her a hippie. <laughs> that would be an accurate descriptor. Um, she was sort of an alternative kind of person that had her children in bathtubs and under trees by herself in the woods and interesting things like that. So um, I had a very um, sort of, you know, alternative in the way that, you know, there were lots of goats and and horses and sheep and chickens and coyotes and teepees. And we just sort of would go off and do our own random things in the world. And she didn't really care about what, what other people think about. We swim in the ocean as babies. And like, most people don't do that. Like, it, I don't know. It was very, we, we, we had an interesting, interesting upbringing, but music was definitely a sort of a centerpiece of that mm -hmm. from as, as early as I can remember, it was something that, you know, my, my mother, both my mother and my father's um, parents were their, their fathers. So both my grandfathers were um, reasonably respected musicians in each of their own fields as a, um, a composer, arranger, and as a, um, a studio musician and uh, band leader and things like that. So sort of different aspects of the music world. And they actually lived, um, they actually lived next door to each other in, oh, wow. in Mount California. <laughs> and I was born in my grandfather's house. So I didn't actually get to meet either of them, but it's just sort of funny how those things kind of, kind of like come together in that way. But yeah, since both, neither my parents really played music, but they really wanted, you know, their kids to. So my sister and I started taking piano lessons and then my mom bought us a tiny harp on the internet or, or in a magazine, I guess that's what the internet was back then. And then, um, yeah, we just sort of started, you know, finding our way with music and taking lessons and then more focusing more on the harp. And, and um, yeah, it was, it was really alternative, I would say, but it was, it was special in, in a lot of ways because I don't think there's that many, it's, you know, there's a lot of sort of standard ways that things go. And there's, I feel like, you know, the, the wildness of that time frame is not, it's not always so, um, you don't find that everywhere. And so as much as it was odd at the time, I appreciate it a lot now. <laughs> it's, it's definitely given you a, an amazing perspective as well, because like you said, you know, the, the majority of people are born in hospitals or at home nowadays, um, yeah. you know, and, and you're raised in a certain way, you taught certain things and it's very much the same, same old, same old. And then you meet the creative mind such as yourself and, and, and me and, and other people as well. And you find that there's, there's a lot of different things that are going on in people's lives. Before we yeah. talk about music, one of the things that fascinates me, and it always has done since I began my career as an artist, um, was the mountains and, you know, things that you were surrounded by, basically. And if I've got the information correct, you were basically living um, surrounded by mountains and horses and teepees. What kind of thing, or how did they play a part in your life as, as a child and obviously then going forward? you know, like, it's, it's, like, it sounds kind of like lame to say it, but like, it's genuinely incalculable. Like, I was born in a bathtub and the bathroom of my mother's, or my, I guess my grandfather's house in Malibu. And she, when I was four, by the time I was four months old, she had put me in the ocean. We lived right on the beach at the time in that house, blessed to have been there for the very brief time that we were. She swam me in the ocean a hundred times by the time I was four months old. Oh, wow. <laughs> she'd go out early in the morning and she just, you just take the ba babies can swim apparently because mm -hmm. they don't forget how to swim. So like, I never learned how to swim because apparently babies just swim. Yeah. And so as I was a tiny little baby, she just put, you put them in the water and I guess they swim like fish, which is super weird. And you know, you hear my mother saying these things and I'm like, with a baby, really? Yeah. But I mean, you know, I'm still alive. And so I guess it's okay. But like, um, that, so like, I mean, I guess in Malibu, having the water was like a really important aspect. Mm -hmm. And that we moved away from Malibu, um, but we still had sort of the hills and the mountains in okay. Malibu. So that was sort of a factor. But when we moved away from there, when I was about four or five, we moved to the mountains and like they sort of took over a bigger part. But I moved back to the ocean as soon as I could. Right. I moved back when I was 16 to be by the ocean. And even in even in Glasgow, feeling like I was <laughs> a million miles away from anything natural, I, I at least was, you know, reasonably still close to, you know, going out, taking the train to Trinidad or something like that. Yeah. And now I live in Half Moon Bay, California. So I'm like, if I, if I ran for three minutes in that direction, I would, mm. I would run off of a cliff into the ocean. <laughs> so that's what we found, it, it, you know, cause it, we're on the West coast of Scotland. Uh, so, and we actually lived in Troon uh, up until last year when we moved. And oh, wow. um, yeah, I mean, I absolutely love Troon and I, I, and I've had the privilege of traveling all over. Um, and I still love the sunsets, particularly just as it's yeah. sort of autumnal here in Scotland where the sky is just beautiful reds and gold. Yeah. I've never seen it like that anywhere else, but, you know, looking over to the coast of, uh, to Arran and, and, and all that, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's stunning. I mean, it really is really, really special. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, folks, if you do get the opportunity to go out and enjoy the mountains and enjoy, um, you know, the, the ocean and the forest and everything there, please take the opportunity to do it because 
you know, it's just amazing when you can actually be out there and all the sounds that are there just lapping up. And obviously it's, it's harder to do at the moment because the entire world is in lockdown. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, but uh, <laughs> I, I actually had um, one moment at the, the beginning of lockdown where I started forgetting what the sea was like. And I made my wife drive past the sea and I was like, I've got to see the uh-huh. uh, So, you know, you, you were talking and you've got a really unique journey, obviously. Um, and, we're, and we're going to talk about music because music for you was, you know, happened at such an early age. You know, you mentioned about piano lessons, but also you got a very special instrument. At eight years old, I believe. Um, mm-hmm. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, on the sort of more hippie side of things, <laughs> <clears throat> my, you know, my mother would have these, these like, you know, little magazines that would have all these little, like, I don't know, I'm, I'm just picturing what would be in it, you know, like little felt trolls or something weird <laughs> like that. And then of course, you know, they have like a, they have a, a little harp, a silly little harp that's, you know, made cheaply in, in Pakistan and, and, you know, basically like a cigar box with strings, but she, she got it for us because she thought it was cute. And, you know, when I think my sister was probably one or two when she got it. So I'll, I always remember it being in the house, but of course, you know, we didn't treat it nicely. We, we put, ropes through it and put it on our back and ran over the house and smashed it into things. So you're pretending we were the heart from Jack and the Beanstalk. It was great. But, um, so I always remember that thing, just taking a real beating from my sister and I in our, you know, in whatever little games, not very caring <laughs> little children play. And then when I was about, I guess I would have been seven or eight and my, um, at school, there was a, a homeschooled girl, homeschooled girl that came in and um, she played the harp and we'd never seen her before because she didn't go to the school, but she came in and played for the kids. And my mom happened to have been in the school that day. So she was able to go up and talk to her mother and be like, where do you take lessons? And so my sister started taking lessons first when she was 11 and my mother drove a hundred miles down to Pasadena from wow. Fraser Park, is a very long way and not a casual drive either. We're talking about like thousands of feet in elevation and going up, you know, one of the, <laughs> the steepest inclines in like a major California freeways and it was, it was pretty intense. So every Friday she took my sister and then I started kind of wanting to weasel my way in. So we tricked my sister into letting me play as well. And it, that was pretty much it for a long time. She drove us there until I believe I was 15 or so. And then my sister and I moved out and sort of drove ourselves to our own lessons for however long. And then I ended up in, in Scotland and stuff, but the harp really just took, took to the forefront pretty much, mm-hmm. pretty much immediately. It's such a special instrument. It's got some real like resonant qualities that like, yeah. I just, they're, they're so special. And, and, you know, I've seen in other interviews and obviously, you know, people talk about this a lot. You know, I love guitars. I love uh, stringed instruments as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also love like steel pans and the 12 tongue uh, steel drum and, and, and all the yeah, different yeah. Noises. I love the different sounds that it makes. Um, and I think you've had, you know, I think I was watching an interview that you did in 2018 um, that you'd had three specific uh harps you had you know two wooden ones and a metal one talk to us about that because it's it's, it's an amazing <laughs> thing because a lot of people think oh well harps are just wooden but they're not well they they almost always are in fact they might always be but anyway so i, I got my little harp when i was a kid um that my it was my sister's harp technically and my uh, my parents got her a lovely harp um, pretty early on because you know once you once you become serious with an instrument you need mm-hmm. something a little bit better than you know the thing that you've banged into walls on your back for the last <laughs> nine years or so um so we um they got her a, a nice harp and I got my first harp when I was a, probably 12 or 13 I think and it was a smaller harp which I sort of always been like I've always gravitated towards yeah. I think which is I don't know for whatever reasons it just seemed more manageable to mm-hmm. me a little bit more pick and transportable and also the sound on that one was just really amazing and I think a couple years later it would have been that I ended up I actually got my, my family got me an actual pedal harp which is you know the big one that you see in the orchestra yeah. it was a smaller size it was about three-quarter size but it was still, um, you know, it was a lot. It was a lot. <laughs> it was like 75 pounds that you had to have a wow. wheel and a dolly and you had to move it around. And then, <laughs> you know, when you start playing that kind of music, you have to start, um, yeah. you know, that that's sort of the more classical side of things. And there's, there's just a sort of different level mm-hmm. that I felt of like commitment to the yeah. craft playing that kind of a harp. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it almost felt like I had to become more serious about it and becoming more serious about it. I was focusing on this music that wasn't really what I was drawn to the instrument yeah. for. And while I liked the sort of re- really love actually the classical music and, you know, it's sort of sweeping nature, but mm-hmm. there was just this 
aspect of me that didn't care enough about it to learn how to play it that well. So I just pissed myself off playing it because I was like, well, that doesn't sound very good. And it's like, well, yeah, but you're going to have to work to make it not sound like that. And then I didn't want to. So I was, I was lucky to have understanding people around me that, yeah. you know, sort of realized that I obviously did play music and I wanted to do something different and they didn't, you know, strong arm me into that one narrow path of only playing classical music. So I started, um, playing pretty, pretty much exclusively my own music and, yeah. you know, just like trad stuff and, you know, Irish, Scottish, mm-hmm. Welsh, English, you know, French, all these weird, anything I could find that was, you know, world music that didn't yeah. sound like classical. And I would listen to the CDs and then I'd start picking things out and learn, make my own arrangements to things and all that. So um, I pretty much let go of the pedal harp um, around that point. And then I, I went to Scotland with, ironically, my neck, my biggest heart besides that one. And I, I brought it over there and I slept that thing for, for four years. And that wow. one had to have its wheels too. It weighed a ton. It was Whoa. so heavy and wheeling this thing around. And, and it was just silly. It, it, like, I don't know why I didn't just bring my smaller harp with me because I thought I'd need more strings or something, but in the end it was just a massive pain in the ass. Yeah. And like, I, I made my living busking when I lived there. So I'd bring, and then of course I lived on like the third flight of stairs. And so I'm like, wheeling this, this oh ship down goodness. these stairs and then like you know walking like a mile down to, and it was just it was it was really not the best thing so wow. when I got back I was I was pretty over the harp when I got back uh-huh. from Scotland because it was so heavy and I'd spent so much of my life not yeah. only studying it in college but I also or at uni but I also had was now like you know had to like make I had to to do the busking and all that so I pretty much cool. just kind of like took a break away from that and focused on other things and did that for a while and then when I sort of came back to it it was, it just seemed like this really big thing. And I was just, I was looking through a harp that was more transportable that I could move around with and I wasn't finding what I needed. And like, I think a lot of people that are not really bound by general restrictions of things when things don't go the way I want them to, I just start imagining the, you know, the impossible things Mm -hmm. and just start, I start, if, if I don't find what I'm looking for or it's not affordable to me or, you know, any number of things, I just start fixing it in my head. So I start making the thing that that would be better than that. So in 2015, I think it was, I started conceptualizing this harp that would be small enough to fit in the overhead bin of an airplane and would have the same amount of strings that my harp that I played on every day had, but would be like 60% smaller. I don't know, like really small. And I started sort of, you know, looking at the resources that I had and how I was going to make that happen. And, um, Um, my boyfriend at the time, who's still one of my very best friends is a metal fabricator. And, um, he, he, you know, generally harps are made out of wood, but I started thinking, cause there's, you know, there's aluminum, other instruments, there's, there's aluminum guitars, there are aluminum ukuleles, there's aluminum cellos, even, you know, they're not a really big section of the sort of instruments that you see out there, but they, they all exist. Yeah. And so I started thinking, you know, with the strength that you could accomplish with something like that, as opposed to the, you know, the relative weakness of wood, if I use a different material, basically, if I strong armed my boyfriend at the time to make me a harp, <laughs> um, then this could be something that would work and, you know, spend however long convincing him because, that's not something that he was particularly yeah. interested in, but, you know, as I sort of was talking about it more and, you know, it seemed like it might actually work. Um, I, I spent, you know, however long designing it to make sure he knew I was serious. And then you made out of cardboard and then, you know, we started the process of actually making it out of, out of aluminum. And, you know, we made a handful of them that were really bad. Okay. <laughs> and then um, on the last one, you know, you change a few things around and you, mm-hmm. you hope that it turns out. And it, as it, as it happened, this one was just, amazing like it's so good it's it's so good and it's been to seven states of province and would have probably so many more than that if this year was regular but it wasn't but um yeah so i i still keep my wooden hearts because they're really important but i needed a specific thing and it wasn't there so i just (laughs) <laughs> made it up and it actually worked which is when I that's what that's why I love when things go like that <laughs> but I think it's an amazing thing you know you, you've touched on so much and you know one of the things again that we want to encourage people you know if you are going to do something create in, in the creative outlet mm-hmm. you know it's hard enough as it is and both Ella yeah. and myself will tell you that um you know and, and I love the way that you you know you you very simply but really really touched an important point 
that if you are going to do something um, and you're looking to really make a difference, you have got to invest big time in it. And if you're yeah. an artist, you don't want to be, you know, putting out artwork that's really expensive if you're using cheap materials. Same exactly. as Ella, you know, you, you don't want to be using a musical Im- instrument that is, you know, really cheap sounding because how exactly. are you ever going to get people to take you seriously? If, exactly. You know, and, and that's, you know, and that was amazing what you said, Ella, as well about, uh, and, I, and I resonate with this, if, if something isn't there, then, you know, we try to find the answer or we try to create it ourselves. And obviously you went and did this in a whole different way as we're going to unpack later on. Um, and it, it, I, I love that. And that's one of the things that drew me to you uh, in, in terms of doing this interview as well, because I just thought there's, there's a connection that's there about creating things that aren't there. And that's when creativity is at its best. And uh, it, it's an amazing thing to know that you're not the only one that thinks like this as well. Absolutely. Wonderful. <laughs> But I've got to ask you as well, you know, I mean, just before we move on from, from music, if I've got this correct, you ended up playing the banjo. Yes. <laughs> Do tell me more. I'm intrigued because I, you know, I, I don't think I've encountered any guest, you know, in all the shows that we've done that has played the banjo or had anything to, to do with the banjo. It's, it's a very, again, different instrument, but that's why it's so interesting. Do you, your son or daughter, struggle with direction, clarity and purpose? Maybe you struggle with anxiety. Maybe you struggle with self-esteem or confidence issues. Maybe you've got great ideas, but you've no idea how to get from where you are to where you want to be. Don't worry, you're not alone. People around the world struggle with these issues. Hi there, I'm John Morris. I'm the coach to the creative mind and I'm also a psychologist in training. For the last two decades, I've worked with people from all walks of life and all over the world, all with a wide variety of issues. I've worked with people from youth groups to adult education to people dealing with day-to-day living issues. And each one of them has an amazing story to tell and we've helped them get clear as to where they are and clear as to where they want to be. And I want to help you too. Like a lot of life coaches and therapists that like to drag things on and leave you dangling on the carrot, I want to make sure that each and every single time that we meet and have a life coaching session together, that you never ever leave saying, man, that was a waste of time, or I didn't get the value that I desired. I am committed to making sure that each and every single time we meet, you are one step closer by the time we finish to a goal that you have in mind. So why should you work with me? Well, let me tell you, as I said, I'm committed to making sure that I provide value, that I provide something that's step-by-step and easy to follow. I'm also a fantastic listener. I've been blessed with the gift of listening and I love to listen to people, their stories, their their dreams, their desires, because there's nothing more energetic and passionate to me than when a client gets their first desire or they get that goal or they hit that big target or whatever it might be. And also, As the trifecta, I am committed to you, to helping you take action. So whether or not it be deciding on the university you want to go to, deciding on the course that you want to be at, helping you get excited and passionate about your work environment, whatever it might be, I am committed to helping that happen. I'm also committed if you need to shed some pounds, if you need to gain some muscle mass, if you need to, I don't know, develop your self-esteem, I'm committed to helping you take action and following a step-by-step plan of action that we can put together. But now folks, I want to tell you about the early bird special offer that we are launching right now. It is for 10 people and 10 people alone. That's right, if you are interested in having life coaching sessions with me one-on-one, 10 people have the opportunity to do that and we're looking to help these people change their lives completely. We take ages 14 and upwards, so if you're interested in learning how to get from where you are to where you want to be, to really develop that passion, to live a life that you enjoy as opposed to a life that you wake up and think, ah, you know, how to develop and change your mindset from maybe a negative one to a positive one, understanding what fuels your mindset and understanding what creates the kind of life that you want to live, then get in touch me today I would love to hear from you as I say this is open only for 10 people and once it's done it's done so click that box below get in touch let's have a conversation backwards and forwards and see if we're a fit for each other and I look forward to working with you have an amazing day folks take care god bless and I will see you soon it is it's so interesting so once again I can't take full credit because I stole it from my sister (laughs) so um, my sister which is funny because my sister still plays the harp not not sort of at to the same extent she just yeah. she plays it um you know sort of in a in a, in a casual sort of way in a sort of home setting um but um she, you know she 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 paves the way she's a she's a way paver and um 
I think it was, I don't know how long ago, but she ended up getting a banjo because, okay. you know, I mean, if you think about it logically, <laughs> <laughs> the banjo is objectively the coolest instrument ever. It sounds happy. It's, you know, it's got this kind of podunky kind of vibe to it that just really lends itself to like, you know, kind of bobbing your head and tapping, well, tapping, well, tapping you know, sitting on actually, I learned this the other day. And again, someone may be able to educate me, but uh, Samuel L. Jackson has just done a documentary series about the slave ships. And I learned that bluesgrass and the banjo originally yes. uh, came from the African and black communities. Yep. So I didn't know that. So go a second. Sorry, Hela. <laughs> go for yeah, it. Yeah, which is, it's crazy. Fat. The history of it is just so interesting. Yeah. And just the concept of the instrument as an instrument is like, I mean, you know, it, it's crude in its own in its own sort of sense because, you know, it's like a drum attached to a string mm -hmm. instrument. It's got that sort of twangy sound, but it is so ingenious. What I love yeah. about the banjo is that the banjo is, in fact, it, it, it is a self-made instrument. You know, it's an instrument that somebody just sort of put together. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of really fine lines and really specific things about a lot of different instruments. You know, there's very thin wood on violins and, mm -hmm. and you know, the sort of the, the you know, base of a guitar, you know, and like the, the, all these things are really, yeah. really important. And the banjo is a stick attached to a drum. <laughs> and obviously there's amazing intricacies and, and, you know, carving and beautiful woods and tone things. And obviously so much more that goes into it than just that. But what drew me to it, I think was just that it was in fact, such just kind of like a DIY sort of a thing with a great sound that really is still pretty unusual. Um, the guitar is actually really, really hard. <laughs> like the guitar is super hard. Like anybody that's like, oh yeah, like guitar, piano, you know, like easy instruments. And it's like, they're common, but yeah. they are really hard. Like the guitar is, I have huge hands. I cannot make my fingers do anything on the guitar. Like it's just, it's super challenging. It's got that, and the tension is tough. And so yeah. banjos met a whole lot of needs for me. First of all, my sister played it. So introduction was good. <laughs> and also it was just, it was odd. It was interesting. The tension's really light. You only have, you know, four strings that you're fretting on. And um, so she got one and, you know, she learned a little ditty or something. And I was like, oh, teach me your little ditty. And of course I learned it and then ran with it and then got my own banjo and <laughs> stole that fully from her, which of course she still has her banjo and she still picks away too. Um, but I got my first banjo uh, when I moved back from Scotland. I spent a year, th that year where I wasn't doing other things. Yeah. I was, I was building a, a house. I built a 120 square foot house on a trailer so I could afford oh. to exist being a, an artist so I could move up to the Bay Area. But during that year, um, I was, I was pretty outside of the harp. Music was kind of a, <clears throat> like a secondary thought. I was writing more music, but I wasn't really playing anything. I didn't, wasn't really focusing on it. So I wanted to have fun with music again. Yeah. And the banjo was just sort of a means of doing that. So, you know, I, I got a reasonably decent banjo, the best that I could afford. Yeah. And um, just kind of started my path of self-learning with that. And then I had that one for a long time. I actually traveled for years with that. That was, the banjo was actually a, a huge portion of the reason that I ended up designing the harp because I just take the banjo with me everywhere I went. And because it's, you know, still small enough that you can put it in the overhead bin of an airplane. And I thought it was so cool. I just shove all my clothes in there and travel over with the banjo. But of course, you know, then people start thinking you can play the banjo because if it's the only thing you're taking with you, you'd probably be able to play it, but I really can't. <laughs> but anyway, um, I, yeah, I had that for years. And then as soon as I made the, the harp, um, I, I didn't take the banjo with me anymore. And it kind of fell out of, of use with me, but it, it was kind of sad because I, I really liked a lot of the songs I wrote on the banjo. I really liked the feel of it and, and the, the action of it. So I bought a banjo. I bought the smallest banjo that um, dollar signs can find yeah. you. <laughs> the smallest, <laughs> cheapest banjo. It was like $200 on eBay. Yeah. And it's, it's made in China. It's tiny. It's, I mean, objectively kind of a piece of crap, but a banjo is not, you know, the, the components on it aren't really that great. The yeah. fretting was amazing. And it was so, so, so small, but it, it provided me an instrument that I could, you know, modify to whatever my um, specifications were. That's always the first thing is you modify everything you have. And if that doesn't work, then you, you sort of start thinking ahead. So I modified it to our, you know, to where I could, I could have it down to be in a slightly lower key and, but it was still higher than my regular banjo. And, you know, then you start, all the wheels start turning and you start thinking about all the ways it could be better. And so I started designing um, my, my ideal banjo and I've made two of them now. The first one was pretty decent. And then the second one that I finished about a couple months ago, I guess, this summer, is just, it's so good. There's a yeah. lot of things to be desired still. You know, I, I've never made instruments before, really. I mean, I, I design things, I do things, but like, 
you know, the actual physical doing yeah. things in wood and like putting it all together. I have no idea how it works. I just figure that, you know, because I've made other things, this will probably work out, <laughs> but like, you know, the skill level is very low, but um, this second one is actually really good. Like it, it sounds, I'm really, really impressed with it. I've made it so that it can be strung in, um, in regular tuning or regular strings, regular banjo strings, medium gauge, but still regular strings. And it's tuned to the same, um, uh, key as a regular banjoist. So it's an open G and um, yeah, it's just, it's the most delightful little thing. And the important part is that that banjo fits inside of my harp <laughs> which fits inside of its case, which fits inside of the overhead bin. So I can travel like with my little Russian dolls all stacked inside and I can take both my instruments with me. So I, I, that's I know the long story of the banjo. <laughs> well, I know what we're laughing about it, but it, but it's true. When I was in the United States in 2012 and they said, you know, bring your musical instrument over there. I was going over there with my business, with my art business. Um, mm -hmm. And they said, oh, bring your, your guitar over as well you, you might have some opportunities to do some gigging and, and uh, yeah. performances and things and I'm thinking okay great well at that time I was using my 12 string guitar and anyone that's mm -hmm. ever played a 12 string guitar knows the neck on it is double wide Quite, it's double yeah. long um, it's it's a it's a brutal instrument as well um, especially if any if anyone ever gets hit with it it's brutal because that <laughs> um, but I actually prefer my electric <laughs> guitar um, but what you were saying there you know and, and I'm the same with, with uh, bar chords and things I try to find you know hacks and cheap ways of doing it because my fingers just don't work the same way that other people's do and you know yeah. that's um, but but it's true, you know, and that can be a real uh, struggle and a real difficulty, especially obviously if you're traveling around a lot. I, I don't these days um, and I haven't done for some time. But I remember when I was gigging and doing that, it was just, you know, right. OK, well, it doesn't fit in the boot. So it's got to, you know, go a certain direction yeah. on the back seats and everything. I've got to ask you as well. And, and this this is part that fascinated me, I think, probably the most. How did you end up in Scotland? Um, I ended up, let me mute this. Sorry if I can do that. Um, I ended up in Scotland because again, my sister, she, she comes up with all the great ideas. Um, so I was, I guess I was 15, 16 and my sister, um, was, I think she was 17, 18 and she had, was trying to figure out, you know, what colleges and things like that and where she, what she was going to do. And, um, she found somehow, I'm trying to remember how, I think it was because we went to CalArts and I think they had an exchange program with the RSAMD, now the RCS um, at the time. And then somebody mentioned the, um, the BA Scottish music section of that. And um, of course, you know, that's a totally unique thing in the States. If you want to study music, you study classical or you study jazz, that's it. There's, you know, there's, I think there's a Celtic studies section. If you go to Berkeley or there's a few other little like minors that you can have, but if you want to immerse yourself in anything other than classical music, you're or jazz, you're pretty much out of luck in the yeah. States. Yeah. Um, so, or at least at the time I have, I really haven't done much research into it now, but at the time that was, that was all that I could find. And so, um, Brian McNeil, who was the head of the, of the department of the Scottish music mm -hmm. department at the time, he was in California for some reason. And my sister was able to set up a, um, an audition mm -hmm. at the time. And it, it didn't end up being right for her for a number of reasons, but when it came turn for, you know, my turn to sort of start looking at those things, it was pretty much the only thing I was looking at. It was mm -hmm. the only place I applied. It was the only thing I cared about. It was like, it just, it was the only thing that, that made sense to me because as sort of unknown as it was, at least it was wasn't this sort of boxy thing yeah. and I, I tend to you know if it's however weird it's going to be if it's going to be weird I'm actually easier with it than it being like this sort of you know more regimented normal thing because I'm sure it has something to do with the history and the teepees and the coyotes and stuff but that's okay <laughs> but um it just seemed like why not well just sure I'll just try it so it was the only place I applied to I, I got in and then I went but it was interesting because my my um previous schooling was was odd in a lot of ways because I, I went through regular school and then I, I was out of regular school. I was in school for, you know, however many years. And then I was homeschooled. Yeah. I just did nothing for however long. And then I went back into school. And then when my sister was going into high school, my mother didn't want to put her into the regular school oh. system because she, you know, we, we didn't have the greatest school up there. And like, she was really smart and not focused, which is not a good combination for somebody that has the potential to be vaguely troublemaking as well. So um, my mom talked with, you know, various people that she knew and found out that you can actually, at the time anyway, I'm not sure if you can do that anymore, but technically kindergarten through 12th grade, you can get, if you have permission from your school, you can take classes from the community college. 
Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, so we in America, we have two year colleges and then we have four year colleges and two year colleges are a lot more inexpensive. You can go to a two year college for two years and then you can you can um, apply to get transferred to different colleges. Okay. And so it's a, a more in effect, in a, inexpensive, I should say, way of getting into a better college because you can take the two years at the you know sort of local level and then you can transfer over to schools that are more expensive and just pay for the two years as opposed to the four because everything here is a million bazillion times more expensive than is ever reasonable. So um, we started taking with permission from the school that we had, we got this online school specifically basically so that they'd say we could go to the college. And then um, we just started going. So I was about to go into seventh grade and my sister and my mom, my mom was like, well, your sister's going to go to the college. I'm going to take your sister to the college. You can go to seventh grade or you can come with us to the college. I don't really care what you do, but you might never see us again if you go to seventh grade. And I was like, well, shit, like, <laughs> I guess I'll go with you then. Yeah. So I was actually 12 when I started taking community college classes. Right. And that was what I call it, what ruined my work ethic, because that was when I started going, I would go two days a week. I'd go on Mondays and Wednesdays and I'd work all day. Okay. Um, um, you know, I'd have classes all day at, at work, but, or at school, I mean, but you, you'd like, and, and you'd have all the time in between, you'd work on things, but I had five day weekends the, the rest of the time I didn't do anything. Yeah. And so all of a sudden it's just like, you know, you, you, you sort of put in your time and then you have all this freedom behind it. So I'd taken, um, you know, all these various different classes and it was, it was really interesting to have been at sort of like a college level in America and then to have gone over to the UK because I was in, technically I was in community college for five years, which if you look at it just from that to to get, take five years to get your two-year degree, it doesn't sound very good, but I was 12 to 17 and I didn't have, I I didn't have an, you can't take that many credits at that age because they won't let you, you can only take a certain number because they don't want to overload you or something, which makes sense. So finally, when I was done with that, I'd actually lived on my own for years. I had a job. I didn't live at home. I'd been to college. I'd graduated college. And then I moved to Glasgow and I, I, I go into the, the Scottish music section, the smallest section where there are, for the first time ever, biggest year that ever had 17 other people yeah. besides me. Oh, and I mean, I was in reasonably small classes in, in community college, but like, you know, you're talking like 30, 40 people. Yeah. And all of a sudden now you're, it's you and 17 other people and that's it. Maybe it was 16, maybe it was 17 overall, I can't recall. Um, but it was, it was really small. And, you know, these are people that like, <laughs> that like ha- have never done laundry before and haven't never left their house. And it was yeah. like, and I'm with like, and I was 19 at the time and I'm with like 17 year olds that have, you know, lived in the Highlands or wherever and like haven't done laundry. And there was like, and I'm American weird, I'm California weird. <laughs> and then like, I'm moving to this like very traditional, you yeah. know, sort of course with, and it was like a huge culture shock. It yeah. was interesting. See, I, I found that when I moved to Scotland 10 years ago, uh, well, it's crazy that it's been that long. But it has, you know, and, and you know, I mean, I, was, I grew up born and raised in West Yorkshire in Huddersfield uh, in England and moved up here and uh, as a youth worker. And again, it, it, the, there was, and people always say this, you know, there's going to be a culture shock. I don't think it matters where you go. Um, yeah. There's some cultures, obviously, that shock you a lot more than others. Uh, and there's others that are like completely overwhelming. Um, it, it's a very different world up in Scotland, that's for sure. Um, yeah. How did you adapt and adjust to all that? Because, you know, and, and again, like what you're saying, it is, it's still amazing that, you know, people now in their 20s still have never cooked for themselves, never cleaned for themselves. Yeah. And, and it's getting older and older and older as, it, as time goes on. And you're thinking, guys, seriously, you need to be getting, you know, these, <laughs> yeah. you know, like how to boil an egg or, you know, you know, the fact that one guy had burnt cornflakes or, some, or cereal and you're like, is that yeah. even possible? I know. Like, I remember it's one of my most distinct memories. I I was in student halls and I walked down to the basement where the, you know, where the laundry machines were and two of, (laughs) two of my, of my, um, you know, other people on the course, there's just two boys and they're sitting there with their arms crossed and they're staring at the laundry machines. And they were just like, they're just, they just, they're just looking at it, you know, just maybe it'll, maybe it'll make sense if they stare at it long enough. And I like, trying to get it to work. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, I never, I never asked them. I just, yeah. re, you know, they, they didn't specifically say anything, but it's like, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> Arms folded, staring at it. And I was like, well, I gotta go. But, you know, the, the other thing is you moved to Scotland, same as myself, without knowing anybody, which is a yeah. really bold step to do. How was the adjustment period for you, obviously, of moving to a completely different part of the world? Um, you know, was it exciting? Was it terrifying? What was it like for you? You know, it was really awful. Like <laughs> you, you try, you, you know, you, you try to make the most of things when you're in them. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> I mean, I gotta be honest. I, you, like, I'm laughing because <laughs> yes, it, mine did not go without a hitch either. So go on. It it was it was so bad. Like you know, I I try I tried to make the most of it. I really yeah. did, and I did, and I stayed, and I didn't leave, and I you know I I buffed up and 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 did it. I stayed for the whole four years, but it was just the hardest yeah. time frame of my life. It was it was really hard. And you know, I moved over, and I had this whole concept of you know what what Scotland was going to be like. I'd never mm-hmm. traveled. I was like, I mean, I, I traveled slightly around the states. I'd been there one time. I went I went to I did actually go there for about three days. And like, it'll never cease to be absolutely hilarious to me. Just just I went with my dad to New York, and then we went over. We checked out the RSAMD, you know, to do the response thing but it, it, it we might as well have not gone it, that my memory of those three days in mm-hmm. scotland <laughs> will re- forever remain just so radically different from the experience that i had yeah. that it, it can never be rectified and it's so funny because i still remember that that travel despite having lived there and having you know been in the actual yeah. you know sort of like, like environment and culture and all that but like i still remember <laughs> how hilariously wrong I was about everything. Like, you know, I'm like, Oh, everybody, I don't know. It was just like, just my impression of everything was yeah. so funny when I showed up there. It was just like, I don't know. Like, I, and you know, there were a lot of personal things that were going on. Like I, <clears throat> I had left my boyfriend in California and then, you know, you try to stay together and then you break up and then, yeah. and then all these things that, you know, sort of interpersonally. And then like, I was just so weird and like, I couldn't connect with anybody. Like, and then, you know, you, you, you work your way through things and you, you know, sort of make your allegiances and alliances yeah. that you need to, and you, you try to be as normal as you can. But like, I mean, and I mean, also it was, you know, I was at the time I was trying to figure out a bunch of health things about myself. I didn't eat meat. I didn't, I was vegan for a while. I didn't drink alcohol and I was broke. So I couldn't spend anything. I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't hang out with people. And it was just like, you know, I, I was yeah. in the worst setup to come over because it was, you know, I, I was California weird. And like you tried being a re- raw, raw vegan in Scotland in 2008, man, that was, yeah. <laughs> that was terrible. It was just like, oh, it was horrible. But, um, you know, you, you do what you can, you make the most of it. But honestly, you know, I, I made my friends, I, 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 that I, you know, I still have to this day, yeah. but I was in such a crushed personal space that yeah. like, it's hard, it's hard to look at that time frame with anything other than just like cringe worthy, like, oh my God, I'm glad I made it. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think that people often forget that they, they assume because they knew, knew you at one phase in your life, that that's mm-hmm. who you are. And I keep telling these people over and over again, just because you knew me or you or whoever yeah. when you were in your twenties or in your teens, that isn't yes. who we are now. Um, so you know, and it's, it, it's a very interesting thing and you're not alone with some of the experiences that you went through, um, certainly moving to Scotland because I found it really difficult and I found it difficult for a long time. Uh, yeah. nowadays I'm very, very thankful I get to work from home and I don't see another living soul apart from the courier. Um, you know, that, that works for me really well, but interestingly enough, if I've got this right, you are one of the only people I think that I know, um, that actually studied, uh, Gaelic. Yes. Which is phenomenal, first of all, because I'm, for those of you that don't know, um, how, how can I describe it? Gaelic is an ancient language. It's, you know, it, it's surrounded by beauty and mystery and so many other things, and it's a forgotten language. How did you end up studying Gaelic? Um, that was one of the most important things to me from mm-hmm. the get-go, was, was, you know, sort of looking at the course and looking at, you know, um, another thing that was that was odd was, you know, in American colleges, you, you choose all your courses. And I think that probably does have some mm-hmm. bearing in probably larger courses in, in the UK. But, you know, I was basically what was weird is I, I went from American college, essentially, to to American, but yeah. also Scottish high school. <laughs> so yeah. it was like it was more like sort of, a you know, where these classes are set up for you. And this is what you have. And, you know, you have one or two electives, maybe, but you basically are sort of set with this uh, with this structure, which makes yeah. sense, you know, because how many how many electives can there be when you're studying traditional Scottish music? Music, not to be you know to narrow it down to, to just that because of course there's a there's a lot of facets to it but you know it makes sense that they would have the sort of set out um um you know sort of basics for that and um in first year and second year I think it was first year second year well I think it was first year Gaelic was compulsory and then you could take it as an elective after that but okay. that was just a huge selling point to me because you know I've always been interested in you know sort of the concept of languages and you know different the the sort of culture that goes along with you know the translations with what you're actually you know saying within that and everything and um i keep silencing this and it doesn't seem to be working i apologize for the little things that are coming they're they're little memory memory balls um but yeah so 
the, the gout was a huge, huge component of why it was in, important for me to sort of do that. And, and the education, what I always go back to is the education, the strictly like the knowledge and the music and the sessions and all of those things, despite my wild, you know, not <laughs> my interpersonal, you know, issues with connecting yeah. with people. Aside from all of that, the education was absolutely it was amazing mm -hmm. like it was so amazing and like taking folklore and, and taking you know you had to take scots for the first year it was it was intense it was really amazing it was just it was the coolest thing so um yeah i took gallic in first year obviously you have to and then i took it as an elective in second and third year and in third year um at the rcmd or sorry the rcs now um you had to have a, a primary study and a secondary study and okay. so of course harp was first and i did scott song for the first um two years because of course i didn't didn't know gallic and didn't want to learn it quite like that but in third year where, when I actually graduated, I didn't get my, didn't do my honors year. Um, I graduated. So technically my, my BA is in um, Scottish music and Scottish Gaelic um, singing. Wow. So I have, um, after I did that, uh, my, my visa was for four years because I assumed that was how long it was going to be. But yeah. towards the end of my um, second year, I realized that third year was, you know, obviously you can do your honors year or you can just graduate, you know, in the three years. And it made more sense to me, um, monetarily because yeah. you know that was right at the at the huge crash that we had in america a really bad recession yeah. and it was like you know I, I was i was paying for a lot of things as well and it was just starting to be you know kind of kind of heavy for everybody so yeah. it made more sense to you know to go to Sol Morostic because yeah. they had you know much more competitive rates for that and um Solmore is the um, the Gallic college that's on sky and um i had been there in first year we took a, a field trip with with callum who was our um our Gallic teacher and it was just so special we played music and you know we went to the Kaylee and like it just was that was what I was picturing Sky yeah. was what I was picturing when I thought about moving to Scotland and of course I end up you know living on Queen Street and oh you, no <laughs> on Queen Street on Queen Street and so you know you walk out at three o'clock yeah. in the afternoon and there's you know there's a giant pile of blood and someone's vomiting in a church and you're like cool <laughs> Yeah, and, and yeah, the, the you know, thing is, folks, Ella isn't, you know, uh, you know, embellishing the story or anything. That is the literal truth. Anybody yeah. that has been into Glasgow, and I've been in Queen Street a number of times, um, it's a whole nother world. F funny story, Ella, just, just while it came to my head, one of my first yeah. gigs that I ever did was the west side of, of Scotland, west, west side of Glasgow. Mm -hmm. And uh, to say that I was terrified for my life and I genuinely thought we were not going to get out there with our life. It was a place called the Liquid Ship. It's now closed down and it's no longer there. But literally, I thought they're going to absolutely, you know, kill us. And and, and that's and, and this is, you know, when you, you're cutting your teeth and everything and, and trying to get out there, this yeah. is the things that you go through. That and that's was, on the West End. That's on the nice end. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's an experience for sure. <laughs> it certainly is. It certainly is. But I've, I've got to ask you as well. Um, it, it sounds to me that your start as a performer got going really more out of necessity rather than just desire. Have I got that right? Yeah. I mean, I, I feel a lot of, um, I mean, I honestly, like the way I look at it is, is when you're weird, there's only so many things that you can really do. You know, there's only so much normal that you can take. Yeah. And yeah. when you're weird enough, you know, there's only the weirder paths really make sense. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in a sense, it's sort of relieving because I think the most challenging thing in life, because even with my weirdness, it's been hard for me to find my own sort of pinpoint, yeah. but it's so hard to find, you know, what you actually want to do in the specifics yeah. of what you actually want to do. So, you know, with all the, I'm grateful for that because it's just sort of like a, it is a necessity. It's like a, I mean, I, I think that when you really find what your passion is, it's like, it's something mm -hmm. that drives you. It's not like you have a choice about it. It's not like, yeah. oh, I like this thing and, and this thing is nice or that thing is nice. There's all kinds of things I think are nice in my life, but my specific, you know, direction and angle with it has gotten so much more pointed. And like, you can tell eventually yeah. when you get there, because it's the only thing it's like, it's like being chased up the stairs with scissors. It's like, it's following you and there's nothing you can do. You can't yeah. just stop doing it because it, it won't let you, you know, and that's, I'm, I'm grateful to have that because otherwise it's. <laughs> I find that sometimes really frustrating. I know a lot of people that are on our team find that Im immensely frustrating because there are times like we've just finished, um, you know, uh, my brand new book. Uh, and uh, congratulations! As, as, yeah, as, as soon as we've finished that, I'm now thinking about, oh well, I've got this idea for this and this idea for that. And literally, like you said, exactly to the point there, it's one of the things you can't shake. It just goes on and on and on, and it consumes yeah. you to the point of, oh my goodness, this is just you know crazy. 
uh, and all sorts of different things. When you first start as a performer, and obviously as a, you know playing the harp and, and busking in Glasgow, number one, it's very, very unique, uh, and you don't see that many out there. What was that like for you when you, you know, on that first day when you were doing that and you're wheeling this harp out there and you start to play, how, how did you feel? Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I made it without working for however long and then uh-huh. it was very clear that that wasn't going to work anymore. The pound was horrific to the dollar yeah. at that time. It was like twice, twice as much. So, you know, you, you go to buy something and it's, it's, you're, I was just hemorrhaging money. <laughs> it was, it was really challenging. And, you know, I was trying to be careful about things, but like whatever way you slice it, I said, the money that I saved just was not going to continue. Yeah. So um, I, you know, I got my, whatever that thing is called that you had to get, you go and work something. And so I went and got that. And then I got a job. I had worked at an ice cream store in California. So I went and I got um, a job at the Ben and Jerry's and Buchanan galleries. Nice. And I worked there for a very short period of time. And I have a really hard time. I have a hard time working for others. I, <laughs> I have a hard time. That. Yeah. I, I just, it didn't, it didn't last very long. And I was making four pounds, 65 P an hour. Wow. And that just I mean and, and when I would go busking in my spare time I would make 20 pounds an hour and it's yeah. like you do the math I'm losing yeah. money by working here so I quit that and I started busking and I was just so grateful that I could make that I could make it work because you know it, it wasn't yeah and then you know in, in my third year I, I paid my rent with busking I paid for, yeah. for all my living expenses with busking and and so I, I you know but the, the downside of all those things is that you know you don't get to to take days off when it's pissing rain and yep. it's freezing and you know you have to pick your times around that and like I would you know and I lived in that third year especially I lived on on Brunswick Street off of Ingram and I would walk I would carry my harp down those stairs and I would walk you know however long like I guess it wasn't a mile but like you know all the way down yeah. to my spot on the corner <laughs> on Buchanan Street and then I would you, know, you bus for however long and you try to make a certain amount of money and then you know you go but you know I got I got robbed, you, you know, a couple of times, you know, you get, you have drunk women that are sitting on you and you're like, Oh, your dress is falling off and you aren't wearing underwear. Like it's, you know, there's just the things that happen, you know, you just don't see them coming. Yeah, I, I know. And, and it, it's completely true. And I think that's what, we, you know, a couple of months ago, there was, there was a big ad campaign that went out that was saying, you know, creative minds basically, um, you know, are, uh, a, a, you know, a lesser skill and they were really downplaying it. And that drew me absolutely insane. And oh obviously, my God, I hate those. well, because of the reach that we've got, I started a campaign and I was literally like, this is absolute garbage because without, yeah. you know, the creative mind, you don't have authors, you don't have books, you don't have films, yeah. you don't have music, anything. Oh, insane. Anything that you can see is gone. Oh, um, it's so, it's so that was so insulting. Like, I mean, yeah. I, I still have, you know, my Facebook friends over there and I was seeing these posts and it's yeah. like, like, I mean, it, it, like the place that it hit me to mm-hmm. see, you know, to see like some, a, you know, a ballet dancer or whatever and be yeah. like, oh, she could, she could be in, in, in tech. And it's like, yo, yeah. all the bad words go. But, but, like, you, well, absolutely. But like you were saying, it's so difficult for some of us. I mean, we've interviewed so many people on this show and, and all yeah. creative minds of different ways. And every single one of them has pretty much come to that same conclusion. We couldn't go and work for someone else. Yeah. Just our mindset. I've worked for other people and got myself in a ton of trouble before. Yeah. Because I was trying to do the right thing, but it yeah. wasn't necessarily their right thing. Um, yeah. I'm literally about to quit my job today or tomorrow because I can't, I, I mean, I just, you know, I, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. You got to like, when you're weird, you just got to roll with the weird because that's yeah. all you can do. And, and, and I, I like the fact that you're saying that because it, it actually makes me feel better because you, you finally find that, you know, kindred spirit and that connection where you're like, yeah. you're not the only one. But yeah. the good thing is with being really weird and being out there and odd, you can actually be one of those influencers that social That's media are reading about now, That's um, which is incredible. So, you know, so get, to, to get back to your story, you know, you having this time now as a performer, you're really paying your dues. There's no doubt yes. about that. Um, at what point do you decide I'm going to move back to America, you know, and, and, you know, where does your story really go from here? You know, when I, (laughs) when I first moved to Scotland, I was like, I don't know when I'll be back. I'm going to be some hot Scottish man and get married and live in Scotland and be a highfalutin world traveler. You know, you think all these hilarious things and then, you know, you find yourself deeply seated in your reality with 17 other people that are 17 and you're like hmm 
yeah. <laughs> like it was very clear almost immediately that I was not going to stay. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just, I had terrible luck, you know, with all of my interpersonal relationships during that time frame. Yeah. So by the time it was over, my, my penance was, was done. I, so I did my time <laughs> and I was very much ready to leave. What year um, was this, Ella? What's that? What year was this? Um, I moved over in, it was September 19th or 21st of 2007. Right. And I left June 20th of 2011, I guess it was, right. which was the best day ever. <laughs> um, yeah. And I mean, I, I don't mean to sound so heavy on those years, but there, you go through a lot of personal stuff yeah. in your life. And unfortunately, my worst personal developments and my worst personal, you know, there's all just all these things. And I had health yeah. problems going on and, and, you know, eating problems and eating disorders on all mm-hmm. different sides of the spectrum and like stress doesn't help that no. and no. love Scotland I wish I could have fit in more but when you have all these other things that are happening in your life anyway you know you're, you're just in survival mode you're just yeah. trying to make it yeah. and you know to, to get through to the other side where you feel like you fit in and sort of make that happen so I always knew I was going to go back yeah. and you know when I did um when I lived on Sky the year that I was there um I was you know kind of trying to to and and right before when I moved um, from Glasgow up there, mm-hmm. I was trying to figure out how everything was going to work. And I wanted, I've always wanted to live in the Bay Area, yeah, because my my um I have family up here, and you know my dad and my stepmom live right on the coast, and I've always just loved this environment, and I knew I wanted to live here. But then you know I'm I'm looking on on you know sort of like our classified things and seeing how much rent is and being like, oh. <laughs> going to be hard yeah um so basically it was this sort of moment of being like well I'm either going to have to you know like live in a tent or I'm going to have to get a real job and neither of those sounded particularly appealing so I found out about um tiny houses and that you can just buy a trailer and build a house on it and live illegally and that sounded totally decent to me so I bought my plans and when I moved back I built my tiny house and that that really sort of started my um creative freedom for me because building that over the, the year that I did was enough time to take away from the music that by the time it was over, I was sort of ready to get, to yeah. sort of find my way back into it. I did a lot of songwriting in that year. And then when I moved up, um, up North here, then I've been, um, you know, just kind of finding my way slowly into making music be the sort of forefront of my, of my existence, which I'm very, very close to um, uh, now, which it pretty much, pretty much is in its entirety. So yeah, it's been, um, it's, you know, when you just have to follow what, what, what you're feeling and what you aren't. And, you know, what was weird is that when I moved back, I was playing weddings and doing things mm-hmm. with my harp and, and doing all the gigs and doing the things that, you know, you would think would make you perfectly happy because, you know, you're making your, your living with music, yeah. but you know, it like, even that wasn't working and that that's, but that's what I think is so interesting about all this is that it's like, you know, you can think that your passion is music and maybe it is, but if it's a facet of music and it's not the one you're doing, it doesn't matter because you're going to be unhappy in what you're doing. And like feeling dissatisfied with making my living with music was like the most uncomfortable feeling I'd ever felt because it was like, what the hell else do you want to do? Like, this is it, dude. Like this is, this is your, this is your shit. So, I mean, finally I, I realized that like, you know, I just needed to sort of see where that I wanted to go with that as it turned out like you know the songwriting thing became a bigger a bigger focus and then the recording and the touring and all that stuff became bigger as well and then sort of you know this greater whatever I'm trying to work towards that sort of drives you in order to do that the sort of things that you want to accomplish that that take you along that path and when you you know finally when I found that it was like okay this is this is actually what it is but it's just so interesting to me that there's so many pieces of it you know like yeah like you would think that when you're doing creative things that everything would be great because you're a creative person and like, well, you want to play music, but it's like, well, yeah, but I don't really want to play weddings where it's this isolating yeah. thing and you show up and then you leave and like you're responsible for this entire person's happiness for the rest of that day. Yeah. And if you mess up, then, you know, yeah. and then you leave, you know, you don't get to talk to anybody. It's this very non-communal sort of a thing. And, you know, music is supposed to be, you know, more of a communal mm-hmm. sort of like, you know, that the, the response that you get from the people you're playing to is important. So yeah, eventually um, I was able to sort of lean into that, but it changed a lot of other aspects of my life because, you know, I, all I thought was that I wanted to just move and live my little small house and have this sort of small existence and just play weddings and have this kind of, you know, calm, small thing. And then all of a sudden these ridiculous goals started popping out of nowhere. And it's just like, the hell are you? Like yeah. you weren't here last week, but you can't not do it. You know, that's, that's the thing is like when your passion is knocking on your door, you can't just say no, because your vision of that version of you when you're older, that's sitting there being like, you know, I know exactly how bitter and horrible I'll be when I'm 50. If I didn't, if I don't do this stuff, because yeah. You know, you got you got to do it. Mm-hmm. 
I think absolutely you're right there. You know, there's so many people have these passions and these dreams and desires and they never do anything with them because probably the fear is there. But also, like you said, you know, it is not just because I get told all the time, oh, you should be trying harder to sell your paintings. And I'm like, well, duh. Yeah. you know, it's, 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 it's the one thing that's guaranteed to make me blow my top. Um, because obviously, you know, I've been in business. I've been doing this for 18 years. You know, I yeah. know how it works inside and out. Um, and it's it's so frustrating, obviously, when people do that. But yeah. you've got to find all these different avenues and all these different routes and everything. And sometimes oh, yeah. it takes you down paths that you never even thought it would. Um, and like you, for example, you, I believe, actually was the one that pioneered house concerts. Talk to us a little bit about what a house concert is. Um, house concerts are a fascinating construct. They're they're just a really amazing um house concerts are ancient by the way house concerts are like the original music i mean you know especially sort of if you look back at like you know house kaylee's and things like yeah. that where you know people in towns you know maybe they didn't have a great big space where they could do things they would go to different people's houses you know and when you don't have television and you don't have the internet you don't have all these other things you know you have community and you have music and you have dancing and you have you know this sort of structure of mm -hmm of moving um, community that goes, you know, across, you know, the people that you have in your, in your area. And um, really the idea of it is just as simple as that. I think it's really just sort of bringing back the idea that like music doesn't have to be in halls. It yeah. doesn't have to be in on CDs. It doesn't have to be on, you know, on, on the internet. It doesn't have to be on, you know, what have you on stages. It can be in living rooms and some of the most amazing music in the world that we never have gotten to hear has been played in living rooms. Yeah. And I think what's so wonderful about, um, you know, in, in all of its weirdness, one of the really wonderful things about being alive in this time frame is that, you know, anything goes now, you yeah. know, like house concerts are making a huge swing back, back around, you know, and, and you can, I mean, I haven't had a chance to do it, but you can pretty much just, you know, reach out on your social media. If you have yeah. enough people following you and just be like, I'm, I'm doing a tour. Where are you? Can I come, you know, can I, can I stay after I play, you know, and like, or do you have, a, you have somewhere I can stay nearby, you know, things like that. And you're just putting all these things together. And then yeah. those people bring their friends and like, it's, it's a really great way of sharing um, music in a very community sort of a sense that is just really unmatched in a lot of other settings. I would say when, when gigs are best is when they feel like house concerts, even yeah. though they're not in that sort of a setting, but they're just amazing. They're really, they're really amazing. And it, it's really cool to see that, you know, especially things like so far sounds, I don't know if you've heard of those guys, but yes, they're yeah. sort of yeah, yeah. trying to bring, you know, some concept of that back in, but, but it's getting a lot of traction, mm -hmm. which is good because people really want to have that sort of community feeling where you, you know, you're sitting on the floor and there's 50 other people around you and obviously very un COVID friendly. Um, and you're, you know, you're listening to music and it's it's just it, it changes things it changes a lot when you're in that sort of more you know like focused setting yeah. with with people I think form. it's an amazing thing because you can have an audience of 10,000 people that aren't engaged and nothing happens and you can have an audience of you know 100 people or 50 people that are really engaged or 15 it, people exactly yeah. and it feels like wow this is just amazing yeah. Uh, to go through. Ella, if it's all right to ask you, and again, I'm, I'm always very protective of my guests and everything that's there, um, but what have been some of the greatest battles that you have had to overcome? Um, you know, it's all inside stuff. It's yeah. almost all inside stuff. And I think that's, so, you know, very true for, ever, for mm -hmm. a, a lot of people. But, you know, doubt is such a beast. Yeah. It's so prevalent and I'm getting better and better at fighting those kinds of things. But, you know, I mean, what's interesting is that like, I feel like a lot of us, the creative types yeah. are some of the most depressed and pessimistic people in the world. Yeah. And, you know, despite the fact that, and I think it's really sort of maybe an odd thing for people that don't understand that to understand that because, you know, especially if you're making a living off of your art, you know, it's like, oh, well, everything should be honky and dory because, you know, you're better than not better, but like, you know, you, you've yeah. reached a level of success that most people don't reach and you're just, but that comes with its own set of pressures, you know, and like all of these things with the whole artistic side of your mind also just seem to have parallels in a lot of really negative places. And, that can manifest itself into a lot of different directions. And, you know, I was a very anxious child and, and, you know, sort of like anxiety things and yeah. interpersonal things and that kind of stuff have been really challenging for me. And, you know, just believing in yourself and, and not like, I was, I was isolating this recently thinking about it because it's kind of, it's an interesting concept. It's like, you know, one of the things that people say all the time, is like, Oh, believe in yourself. And it's this trite, ridiculous yeah. thing. And you're like, yeah, okay. Okay. I get that. Like, okay, I'm believing myself. Okay. 
But um, I think the hardest thing, at least in a current sense, obviously, like I'd said, I had, mm -hmm. I had eating disorder issues on both sides of the spectrum in Scotland. I had all kinds of interpersonal problems, but I'd say like as, as a whole, as, as like with the perspective that I'm looking at it now uh, um, as a person in my situation is that like really the core hardest part of all of this, especially as a creative person is actually believing in yourself. Yeah. And like, what I'm realizing is that, you know, it's the easiest thing to say, it's the easiest thing to say, yeah. but the problem is that believing in yourself isn't part of this, like, it's not just like, Oh, I believe in you. So everything's gonna be great. It's like the likelihood that most people artists, especially who knows everybody is, mm -hmm. is that like the thing that you're trying to make happen, you can see all of it. Yeah. You already know, you know, I, I can see the people that would go to the concert that would be sold out. We can all see these things, you know, in our heads, because we know, we know that what we're doing, we know we're doing it for a reason. And we know that we can see what that could be if it were given the right presentation, and all these other things. And, and we kept doing what we were doing. We know what it can be like. We want that. We can see that. But the problem is that the people around you are generally pretty unlikely to see that. Yeah. And one of the hardest things about believing in yourself is when you are around people that don't, that aren't your target audience, they don't see your vision. They don't understand where you're trying to go with this stuff. And, you know, you can see yourself as an artist that goes down in history with fame and not fame, you know what I mean. You, you know what I mean? You, you yeah. can see all these things. I can see all these things. We can see this with our, we can see the potential in our own creativity, but most people never see those kinds of things happen ever in their life. They don't really see anybody that really succeeds beyond getting a job and paying for things and sort of moving on like that. You don't really see that happening. And the problem is that that person, these people that are closest to us generally are not our target audience, yeah. which means that, you know, the people that you're sort of leaning on the sort of community that everybody needs so deeply in order to feel like their place mm -hmm. is most likely not going to be yeah. exactly the, the, pick and chosen pieces that are going to make you feel all the motivation and the inspiration that you need to feel at a given time. And like the real problem, the real thing is that believing in yourself means no one else is likely to believe in you, yeah. but really no one else, like, like your, your spouse, your best friend, your people, because they're probably not your target audience. Mm -hmm. They're not the people that would buy your paintings that would love your paintings, yeah. or maybe they are, and maybe you're lucky like that. And like, I've had really amazing people in my life as well. And it's not to like throw the people that are close to me under no, the no. bus, it's just that like, they can't, they can't see it yeah. because it's a screen that you're looking at that nobody else can see. Yeah. And there's a reason for that. And I think one of the reasons that it's so difficult in art and it's so difficult to overcome these kinds of things is that you're the only one that can see that. And you have to keep pushing through all of these barriers and be truly the only person that understands any of it. Yeah. And that is, I mean, in a way it's very isolating and very hard, but in a way it's also like, oh, it's okay that my friend, you know, my friend is not saying that I'm horrible and that I'm terrible and that all of this is useless. They just aren't my target audience. They're not the person that would go to my gig or maybe they would be if there were 5,000 other people and we're on the radio, who knows? It's all this stuff is like yeah. the presentation of it and the, and the, the way it's, you know, sort of like brought to people is also important. But I think my biggest challenge is remembering that just because other people aren't going to see what I'm seeing doesn't mean it's not valid, doesn't mean it's not good, and doesn't mean I don't need to keep on my path of getting there. Because I mean, my theory now is if you just keep, you just keep walking towards it. If I can see it, if I know it's there, I'm just yeah. going to keep walking towards it. And there's so many things you could focus on. There's so many things you can do. And that gets me down like no buddy's business because you know if i just knew which thing to focus on i'd focus on that and then if you knew that was going to be the one path but there's infinity now especially in the age of the internet you oh, know yeah. you can become a youtube star and get famous that way you can you can become you know you could get go viral with some silly thing you could deliver a pizza and then end up on the internet like who knows everything is so crazy but there's no one way to do it anymore and because of that like i think the overwhelm is just so powerful that sometimes you just have to like let go of all that stuff and just realize that despite the fact that you are the only person that gets this, that is the only difference between, you know, every other person that's made it is they didn't stop walking. Yeah. They were just kept walking towards it. And that's my, that's sort of where I like yeah. center myself on those things now is it's like, I'm just walking towards this inevitability and I can see it. And if other people can't, that's fine. I'll walk as far as I can get. But if you stop walking, you can't get there because you're the only one that sees it. So no one else can really help you get there unless you see it yourself. I think it's a really amazing point that you bring out because again, you know, and people may be shocked to know this because we so far, I mean, we've been doing this show a very short time. We've had really big guests on. We've been very, very blessed. Each and every single day I wake up terrified, anxious, not sleeping, yeah. stressed out my brain. 
I'm like, yeah. you know, even you know, coming on as like, and it is stress of, you know, are we going to get guests booked? Are they going to turn yeah. up? Is the show going to be good? Is this going to happen? Yeah. Is that going to? And it's all the things, you know, anxiety. I, I firmly believe is, you know, often the things that we worry about from, you know, that could be, or the things yeah. that have been. But mm-hmm. it's very rarely the things that are going on at the time. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I literally, even before coming on today. And it's amazing how that really changes you as a person. Because I ain't fun to be around, you know, when I'm in that mindset and when there's so much yeah. stress going on and everything. I'm horrible to be around. Uh, my wife, you thankfully, <laughs> you know, is, is a lot more level than I am. And she's just like, you know, well, you know, well, we'll do this and we'll do this and we'll do this. Yeah. And uh, and she's thankfully one of those people that sees it. But again, surrounding family, a lot of the time, you know, yeah. uh, and even my own folks were like, well, you need to get a regular job. You need to get a normal job. And yeah. like I said, the fact that, you know, we've been doing this for all these years, um, you know, is a testament to itself. I've got to ask you as well. Obviously, you, you talked a lot about, you know, of the, of the struggles that you've gone through. The fact that you're still pressing forward is an amazing thing. Who inspires you? That's an interesting question. I don't mean to sound like a dick, but not very many people at all. <laughs> I like your answer. I do really like your answer. I don't like, think it's a bad answer at all. Almost no one. I mean, I really, th- I think about this a lot. I actually think about this a lot. And, it, uh, and I don't have that many clear cut examples. I mean, I'm obviously inspired by people that have made it, you know, yeah. I'm inspired by, you know, a lot of, you know, folk heroes of the fifties and sixties, seventies, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Like Simon and Garfunkel, Donovan, Dylan, Joni yeah. Mitchell, all those things, you know, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, all, all that stuff. But like, I like modern current things yeah. and like people not that many. I mean, my mom's inspiring to me because she never, my mom's actually, she's a really interesting person. We have a lot of um, similarities, a lot of differences, a lot of complications, which I think is common in a lot of, you know, different sort of ways, but like, um, and, and what's in, she, you know, she's inspiring this sort of sense that like, she's always forged her own path. She's always gone her own way. She's always done things differently. She is the first person that says, yes, quit your job. She's the first person that says, yeah, build a tiny house. And, you know, sure, why not? You know, go ahead. And, you know, and all the weird things, all the weird stuff. Um, if you don't have, if I didn't have anybody that listened to me on that, that would be really hard. Yeah. And my mom is that person. She is that person with pretty much however weird and wacky and outlandish this stuff is. She's like, yeah, all right. You know, she just, she lived in a teepee for six months. She just yeah. doesn't care. You know, she's, everything is just, everything is, you know, your intentions and how you think about things and, and how, what you put into it and, and all that kind of stuff with her, which is not something that comes from everybody. And I share that with me. And I feel like, you know, hopefully that I can help other people in, in that sort of way, but most people just aren't like that. And even other people I know that are creative and are different and are, you know, weird, like it's hard to be as weird as my mom. <laughs> So, I mean, you know, in terms of like actual people, I guess her and, you know, other, other artists that sort of stick to their guns and things like that. But like, you know, the weirder you are, the weirder things become anyway. And, and like, what's also strange in my sort of direction of doing things is that like, I'm, you know, everybody thinks that they're, you know, also unique and all those things. But like, what, what's weird is that like, I have all these different components. Like I make my instruments, I make all my clothes, mm-hmm. I, I make all, everything. I mean, I, I don't wear anything that I don't make on, on a given day. Like I don't make shoes, I don't make socks, I don't make jeans. I make literally every other single thing. I make my earrings, I make my underwear, I make everything. I make my clothes. If I need something, I make it. Like I don't go shopping. I'm, I'm, I just go to my wall. I see what fabric it is and then I make it for that day. Like, but like, all of these components are really important to me and in, yeah. in all of this it's like the creative things are really important and it's like what's the the hard part is that like i'm so scattered because it's like well aren't you just aren't you a musician i'm like yeah but like also I, like i made this hard and then and then yeah. I, I made this this, this you know mm-hmm. thing today and like i tried making talks last week and it's like what like yeah. it doesn't and there, there's there's just no there's not really examples of people that like do that stuff because almost nobody is really that creative anymore and they don't really make things and do yeah. things it's like it's again that sort of just like you know, realizing that your beliefs are sort of going to take it. And like, yeah. obviously, you know, people that, that have made it and gotten to that point, like Joni Mitchell is actually really inspiring mm-hmm. me because she actually paints her own, you know, she, she does her own. She actually sees herself as a painter that got sidetracked by music, which I just think is such a cool thing because, you know, it's easy to sort of look at it when you're so, when your creative brain has so many different, 
very overwhelming jack of all trades sort of tendencies, then, you know, you, the focus is like really difficult. But I think, you know, like she, she'd have her album covers would be paintings of hers and things like that. And like, but there's just not that many examples where those things all sort of meld together, which I think is crazy. But I honestly think it's because so many of us that have that kind of mindset are just so scattered. Yeah. And like, that's why this has taken me until I'm 32 years old to try making it music, which is ridiculous. But who cares? All we have is time. <laughs> the crazy thing is, though, you know, that the, you go the other way and so many crazy uh, creative people that have that mindset are then conditioned to be like everybody else. Exactly. Um, and that's one of the things that I was never able to shake. I just don't fit in for whatever reason. You know, yeah, I've tried. It, does, it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> and it's frustrating. Don't get me wrong. And, and I'm sure there's some people out there that will see this show and probably talk, you know, endlessly about how horrible I am and everything. And that's fine. They can talk. <laughs> They can waste their time with that. But I, I get that because, you know, you know, from a point of view of, well, I'm an artist that does this. I started out as a mountain artist and then I moved to seascapes and then I moved to pets and then I moved to yes. now cityscapes and landscapes and, and famous things and now doing podcasting. And I'm just, I get it. But, you know, in my brain, I'm always like, how can we take this a little bit further? You write a book, you develop another branch of your business and then you do right. a podcast and, and it goes on and on and on and on. Um, and each one of them, especially with this podcast, you know, when I'm looking at the core message of everything is, how are we helping other people? How are we freeing other people, I suppose, in some yeah. ways from the institutionalized stuff that's going on? Um, and, and I agree with you. I, I can't think of many people offhand in, in you know, 2020 that I could say, hmm, so-and-so really inspires me. There, there are a few, yeah. of course, um, you know, but, but not that many, like, like you see. Yeah. I've, I've got to ask as well, because I don't think, you know, this has been covered in any other interview, um, the tattoos on your legs. Um, They've got special meanings behind it. I know they were, and the reason I bring this up is because one of the interviews that you were in, that's on your website, um, and and I think she was going to cover the topic, but never did. So I'm going to do it now. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my so they're they're ginkgo leaves, which okay. is the ginkgo biloba tree, which is a, a one of the oldest trees, like ever <laughs> sounds very scientific um but it's it's thousands and thousands of years old it's the, it's just the coolest tree ever so when i was four and a half almost five i think my mom maybe maybe five anyway my mom met my stepdad and my stepdad was a he's an incalculable creative impact on my life like he is just like i can't even imagine where my life would be without him he's an artist he's an arborist he knows all about trees and wow. he's he works now as a as a greens person moving trees putting trees in front of the camera in um in uh, movie sets in hollywood and stuff he's, he's a fascinating oh, man but he knows he knows so many things he's just he's like the the all-knowing creative santa claus like he knows everything he knows everything he's got a big beard and his name is rick waters greens an arborist he's the coolest guy in the world and he came into my life when i was you know at a very sort of impressionable age and you know you're you, you don't really want your parents to date you know that's weird stuff but like ricky was the coolest person i'd ever seen rick is just he's the coolest person and he lived at the time at this house that had a ginkgo tree outside and my earliest memories of him are he's sitting there and he's like, oh so ugly this was the ginkgo tree and he's talking about the you know the leaves and the patterns and, and it being in japan and china and this ancient tree and like i was just so taken by that and um it's sort of the the ginkgos are sort of like uh sort of directional force that have always uh, which sounds funny, but like, they're, I don't know, they're just, they're ginkgo trees. When I see them, they're like little tokens of like, they're just little sections of like intense happiness that mean little bits of things to me that are really significant. So um, yeah, tattoos are a strange thing, but they're one of the ways that I like to look at mine is they're mm -hmm. sort of like, they're adding pieces on, you know, you, you have yourself, you are yourself, you know, I'm not going to go plastic surgery things and changing my facial structure, but like, they're an interesting thing. That's like, they're like adding pieces of confidence for me. They're like, I don't know. It's, it's a silly thing maybe, but it's like just adding these, these things that are important enough that yeah. they give you more of you than you had before. I can understand. I mean, I've got, I've got tattoos as well, which is another reason that certain folks didn't like me. Um, but <laughs> long hair tattoos, you know, I don't really fit in, in, in a lot of circles, especially in Scotland. Um, but I get that, you know, it, it's, it's something about you that's part of your identity. It's part of yeah. you. And it's not for other people. It's something special for you that when you look at down yeah. on it, you know, you know, sometimes it reminds you of who you are. And especially when you, you yeah. know, your mind is flying off in a different direction. You're like, yeah, it reminds me of who I am. 
Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it is. And it's like these little pieces of things that, you know, then you find all these other ways that they sort of match in with life and all that stuff. I've been doing these, I've been doing drawings recently for, mm -hmm. I finally finished them. I finally sent the order and I'm finally relinquishing some of my creative control. And I'm having t-shirts that are made in America that are screen printed nice. in America with eco ink, but I'm finally having some, some things made. And I just finished the drawing for that. And like putting all the pieces of like my creative I don't know. And, and basically that there, a lot of them are connected to the things that I have permanently on my body, like arrows and ginkgos and, yeah. and things like that. And it's like, I don't know, there's something really centered about like that. And I think, you know, we're all trying to find where we fit and all the things that we have. And it's, I think it's definitely an interesting sort of human thing to just, you know, sort of attach onto these things that make sense to you and keeping them around because a lot of things in this world don't make sense. So yeah, Absolutely. take it where you can get it. <laughs> yeah, as, as we're wrapping up the show, I've, I've got to ask, is there a spiritual side to Ella Harp? Absolutely. And that is probably the hardest thing to describe. And I'm sure I could rant and rave and go <laughs> in all kinds of different directions. But essentially for me, it is it is the, the creative compass. Mm -hmm. My whole angle on this is that like, creativity creativity saved me like if i didn't have this i would be a horrible person and like you know it's easy to be like oh haha -ha. but it's like no yeah. <laughs> i would be a really shit person like it's it's just that's just the fact of it like creativity saves me it mm -hmm. changes my brain chemistry if i'm having a bad day and i you know, when I, and I make something, I sew something and, you know, it's silly, I suppose, because it's these material things, but it's, it's the way that your brain is, is, you know, like working on a reality that it's not, you know, fitting in with or engaging with, and then just, you know, like finding its own paths to, to fix that thing. And then just making something different. And honestly, I, I, as a, maybe an odd part of it, but like the whole reason I'm doing this is because of, creativity and because of it's it's inspiring people to make things it's it's eventually setting up things where more people are facilitated to make things like it's an entire like ella harp if you're looking at it as a thing is it's it's the creative compass it's creative inspiration it's making things for yourself and using that part of your brain when you know, I think there's a lot of escapism techniques, especially these days, you know, you watch things and not that there's anything wrong with that by and large, you know, video games and all these other things, but there's people that have never been able to tap into their creative side. They've never been able to bring that out because, you know, you, you draw when you're a kid and then, you know, somebody tells you you're not good at it or why would you keep drawing? Cause you're supposed to get a real job. And like, there are painters and violin makers and, and designers and all of these infinite number of creative people that are out there I would reverse those stupid ads and be like, sure, well, maybe your freaking tech person is about to become the most amazing, yeah. like, luthier that anybody has ever seen in the 21st century. And, like, I just refuse to believe that we were born to come into this world, to work crappy jobs for other people, to pay our bills, and then die. Yeah. Yeah. There is something that every single one of us has that is so unique. And the problem is that in workplaces, none of us get to be unique. We have to show up on time and we have exactly, and we have to do all these things exactly right. And it's not about the whole, it's about the, 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 the shitty little details. Mm -hmm. And that kind of stuff for the creative mind is death. Yeah. And like, you have so many people that work these jobs and they, and they describe themselves as waking up one day and they're, you know, they're 60 and then they have to figure out how to retire and do all this stuff. And it's like, that's just not fair. We are individual human beings we each have our own strengths and weaknesses mm -hmm. and when you can find out what makes your heart burn and when you can actually do that the the amount that you can accomplish in your life is just there there are no limits on that you know and and some people will reach different levels with it maybe somebody just wants to draw after work maybe they want to who knows maybe they want to you know put some things on on etsy or, or have a pinterest or who knows what like it doesn't what I love about it is that like, it doesn't have to be this grand thing. You don't have to become the next whatever. It's not about that. What it's about is that everyone has a strength. Everybody has their own unique voice on this. And we're so, you know, this dancer could be the next tech person. This whatever could be the next this. We're so as a, as a whole, not just like not understanding of this creative force that is life and passion and and what makes people want to keep waking up every day that we're just, it's just such a waste, you know? And if, if there's, if I can communicate any of these things with the, 
very muddled ways that I'm trying to do it with music and through other means. But if I can do that, if I could become a figure that could help people tap into the things that they can do and be like, okay, well, not everybody's going to do that, but okay. So you want a banjo, you design a banjo. Like I, I catch myself starting to design cars. I don't like my car. I don't like other cars. And I'm like, Oh, <laughs> I'm like, okay, you have to stop. Like you can't design a car, but like, maybe I could one day, but that's maybe. the thing. What are the limits with all of this? If you actually let your brain start thinking about yeah. this stuff, there are 24 hours in every day. And if you weren't spending it, hating your job and hating driving and hating commuting yeah. and hating all the other stuff that you had to do, what would your mind come up with? I suppose that's it. It, it's amazing because I think it was Jim Carrey that said it best. Uh, and I know there's a lot of people that absolutely despise him for, from a mind point of view. Uh, I think he's absolutely phenomenal. Um, and, the, and the reason being yeah. is because one of the things that he said, because um, I'm finding a lot of liberation, you know, and, and I've gone through my own journey and a lot of other things. Um, but, you know, he said something really, really poignant that really delved deep into my heart. And it was, you can fail doing what you hate. So why not do something that you absolutely love? You may fail it. But Seriously. Yeah. And, and that's the thing, you know, you may also be, you know, successful at it. You may yeah. reach a point in your life where, don't get me wrong, there are not going to be days, you know, or, or, you know, it's not going to be perfect every single day. No, and it's not. Like, exactly. There's going to be some times that you're just like, oh my gosh, I do not want to do this. Or like yeah. me, where you're cranky and throwing a fit, um, you know, and, and you've got to remind yourself of your own teaching. You know, yeah. but at the same point, I would far rather be doing what I'm doing now yep. than going back to where I was all those years ago. We've got to fit in this institutionalized. Exactly. Exactly. I was working in a church of Scotland as a youth worker. OK. Oh, and wow. it was, oh yeah. And it was as tough as anything because they didn't want yeah. me there. And, yeah. even though they, you know, they employ you to do it. And then you're trying to fight this constant battle backwards and forwards. Yeah. You know, and it was just on and on and on. But, you know, for, yeah. for me, I wish I'd met you, you know, years ago, because I think everybody needs an Ella Harp in their life of the mindset and the outlook that you've got. I've got to ask you, Ella, just as we're wrapping up, you know, um, <laughs> what are your passions going forward in life? Well, I don't tell this to a lot of people, but this is interesting. And I don't, I, who knows, maybe it'll maybe it'll resonate with somebody that's listening. This, this is going to sound ridiculous and I don't care. So okay. my whole angle and my direction with everything is the end goal is, I, so I make things, right? I create things. I, I do all these things. I make things that I want and I, I make them. I don't really like making things for other people as a general rule, which is a really crappy uh, side effect of some versions of creativity where it's like, I love doing this. It's so much fun. Somebody's like, great, make me 50. And you're like, I had you. I won't. Yeah. Like, God damn it. Like, why, why can't I do this? It sucks. It's so annoying. But um, so for me, it's like, I don't, I don't want to make it, um, but I want it to be there and it should be there. And I have ideas and I come up with things and like, you know, the designs that I make are, they're great. I make the best version of everything that I can have. My shirt designs are my favorite shirt designs. They're not going to be everybody's favorite shirt designs, but they're my favorite shirt designs. Yeah. The, the harp design that I made is my favorite harp design. The banjo design is my favorite banjo design. The car that I'll eventually make, who knows, it could get there, could be the favorite car, who knows. But the point is that I don't really want to make these things. So if I don't want to make them, then I have to find a way for them to get made and have yeah. it make sense. So the end goal is to create a set, effectively a massive empire that hires people in America that are in the most impoverished counties in America and to hire people that are basically coming off the of streets, having drug rehab, having, you know, a, a lot of different components and, and childcare and, you know, a lot of sort of mental health components as well. And then also, you know, support things in various different mental health respects and sort of community things like that. And effectively hiring people, predominantly women and a large proportion women of color. Mm -hmm. And I want to set up places where these people can work 30 hours a week and make full health benefits and have enough money to do everything that they need to do and not want to work at McDonald's for $7.25 an hour when they can work for me and make $35 an hour and have full health care benefits. And it will be a nonprofit. It will be epic. And I will make millions of dollars doing other things that will just put it into that. And the point of this is not to make money. The point of this is to get people that are stuck and dying in their own lack of, of self and giving them something to do and giving them money to do it and making things that will eventually, you know, kind of get out there and it will be promoting these sort of the, the people will be working it and making it and doing it. And then it will be pitching it towards, it's basically focusing on the lowest income and the highest income. So it's pitching these things towards the rich people. I used to live in Malibu. I was lucky enough to live on a horse ranch, shovel horse manure, work in an ice cream store, do all the things I could so I could live in Malibu. And I saw these people, they go to stores, they spend $300 on a white t-shirt. They don't give a shit. Yeah. This made in China, they don't care. 
They just want, they just, they buy things. If they can buy things that will help people, they'll buy things that will help people. But if they can't, they won't. Yeah. So I just want to make it so that it's a sort of, you know, cycle that where the people that have the money buy these really nice things mm -hmm. that are made, you know, consciously and carefully and by people that are having their lives made better all the time. So it's not giving people a fish, it's teaching people to fish and then paying them for it and giving them actual lives for that. So the way, you know, you can't necessarily go on these giant national brigades of trying to make everything better for humanity and trying to make wide sweeping things, you just have to start small. So that's my goal is to start small and make something that can eventually expand out and take a lot of people out of poverty and also inspire a lot of creativity in the process. Ella, I think, you know, that that's an amazing thing. And one of the things that I love about you is for someone that's gone through so much, you've still got an amazing heart that really wants to help other people. And, you know, for, for us, you know, obviously we haven't talked about this off air. Literally, when we came on, this is the first time that we met. But we would love to be a part of something like that because it's a, it's an amazing thing done for the right reasons, with the right yeah. heart, with the right attitude. Um, and I think it, it's true that the sad thing is nowadays that, you know, it's, it's that old saying of the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And there's very little yeah. help, particularly for you guys in the States. Obviously, we're seeing things very differently over here yeah. um, to what you guys are in, in, in the US. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I think it's an amazing thing because there's so many people now that and I, and I firmly believe, you know, I was at one point, you know, religious, you know, uh, teacher, youth worker, minister. One of the yeah. things that I discovered is, you know, people can be taught about Jesus, about Allah, about Buddha, and all of yeah. the, the different religious figures as much as you like. I think one of the things that people that are on drugs, uh, and I've worked at drop-ins, I've, I've spent a lot of my life working there, um, you know, that they need to hear more than anything is that you are loved and that you have a value and, and yeah. self-respect. Because yeah. that's part of the reason, you know, nobody chooses to go on drugs. No one chooses to become an alcoholic. They no. end up on these things as a result of their circumstances and situations. Yeah. And you know, these things may seem, you know, like really big ideas, but hey, you know, if you take enough of the small steps, eventually those big ideas become realities. And exactly. it's amazing. It really is amazing. Ella, is there anything else that you want to touch on before we wrap up today's show? Oh, so many things. First of all, this is the most fascinating conversation I have gone to have hey. in a very long time, whether it be an interview podcast, whatever you want to call it. I, as soon as I got your email and sort of read the sort of description of this, I was like, ah, this is going to be really interesting. <laughs> and I'm really grateful to have been a part of it and your questions and your, and your in insight. And I mean, I'd love to ask you a million questions about you for this thing. So if you ever want to have somebody else interview you for this, Absolutely. Let me know I'm, for that. I'm sure everybody would love to know more about your amazing. situation. Because but this has been so fantastic. It, it's really cool. And the, the thing is, like I say to all of our guests that come on, the joy with mind, body, and soul is that we're able to go in a million and one different directions. Yeah, like which makes sense because that's where we're at. <laughs> well, that's it. The, the whole thing is, you know, we've had people before. Uh, there was a wrestler that was on that I literally believe to this day we got him on. And he's a very, very well-known person. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the only reason he came on, I believe, is because we said, would we be able to interview you, you know, more from a psychological point of view and not just yeah. about wrestling? He was like, yeah, let's do it. You know, <laughs> because everybody always wants to know the same stories. Very interesting. Totally. And, you know, like that, that's great because you, what I love is you learn things about yourself when you say things like this out yeah. loud, you know? So everybody that you, that you have on this is also taking pieces of themselves away where they actually get to use that. Well, I mean, the amazing thing was the other week we had someone on that literally has been interviewed, you know, probably hundreds of thousands of times, said the exact same thing. At the beginning of the show, he was, you know, I'd said to him, oh, we're hopefully going to ask you questions that you, you haven't been asked before. And he was like, good luck. And at the end, he was like, I really learned something about myself. You know, it yeah. was really amazing. And it validated me. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. But I've got to say, Ella, as well, you know, and, and, and this isn't, you know, part of the show. It's not part of the script or anything like that. You are someone genuinely, when I was going through the struggles that I wish I'd encountered, you know, because, you know, your heart, your mind, you know, everything that's there about you, it's like a kindred spirit. Um, yeah. Because like you said, th there's no one like me <laughs> that's yeah. around. And like you said, there was no one like you. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, it, it, I don't believe in coincidence. I believe, you know, everything yeah. happens for a reason or doesn't happen for a reason. And Great. I think, you know, amazing things, you know, I mean, you're, you're destined for amazing things, full stop. You know, you can see the way that you've grown as a musician with your life, your journey and everything else. And, you know, again, I would love to have you, you know, reverse the roles because I miss Absolutely. that. Absolutely. I would love to do that. It'd be tremendous fun. Um, but it's been a blast talking to you. I've had an amazing time and I want to thank you so much. But before we wrap up, where can people find you and your music on, on online? 
Absolutely. I am on Spotify. I've got an, a new track coming out relatively soon. I've got a bunch from my album that will be coming out soon. So you can find me everywhere as Ella Harp. It's one word. So you can go ellaharp.com, Ella Harp on Spotify, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, all those good things. I am findable. Just remember Ella Harp, one word. And it's, it is amazing. I was listening to Ella's music again. I think probably Dirty Money it, at the moment is my favorite song. Uh, hey. There was another one that was thinking of things aren't working out. I think it was. Um, yeah. <laughs> and you know I've just listened to them and again your voice is so different the style that you work in it is phenomenal definitely Thank check you. Ella out folks because I think you'll absolutely love it and it's a very very different approach not only to playing a harp but to music in general is there anything you want to close with Ella before we wrap up I think that's about it I'm I'm really grateful to have talked every, every you know, talk with you and like, just hoping that, you know, people get something out of this and like, thank you so much for doing this podcast. This is really a cool thing. And I'm very excited to see the other people that you taught. Now I want to listen to it. Cause if this was this cool and I learned this much about myself, what am I going to learn about someone else? <laughs> well, and it is really, really amazing. We've started to put together the, um, the, in this season advert and yeah. Katie and I were watching this and it's really, it's coming out in the next couple of weeks and it's really exciting and that's all i can say about it just now but it's fantastic so folks we want to thank you so much for watching the mind body and soul podcast visit ella as she said you know her website and, and music is just phenomenal um and you will absolutely love it but of course you can come out and check out my brand new book at the battles we all face.com because everybody's going through something whether it's anxiety trauma stress letting go dealing with time you know and and just so many more things that are there and i think you'll absolutely love it it's available at the battles we all face.com um, and yeah, you, you will just find it, I think, really life-changing and inspiring. As always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Tell a friend because it may be the very thing, like what Ella's done for me today and hopefully I've done for her, that really, really helps them. Um, and we're finding that more and more in each and every show. And until next time, take care, God bless. She has been Ella Harp. I have been your host, John Morris, and this has been the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast, where we help you find balance in the craziness of day-to-day -day life. Take care.